I talk to strangers day or night. I talk to strangers in any kind of mind. It makes sense to me to believe in the kindness and the trust I today with Jason Narazzi. Hi, Jason. Hi, Stephanie. How are you today? Very well. Glad to be here talking to you. I know. I'm happy to be here talking to you. You're my first stranger I've talked to in quite a while, so I'm glad to go <laughs> get back to it. Um, and I'm talking to you today for a very specific purpose, which is to talk about an event that we're having for your organization, the Jephtha Group. Um, on June 25th, and it's going to be a great um, evening of music. Um, and the Joe Stone Band is going to play, and a gentleman, Kenyatta Emmanuel, who I know you met um, during your time at Sing Sing, correct? Yes, that's right. A longtime friend and phenomenal musician. I promise he will blow your socks off. That's Phenomenal awesome. Phenomenal stuff. Very nice. We're, I've heard him before and he, he is really, he is mind-blowing. And I think... Uh, yeah, he, was a, he, he will move you for sure. It'll be a moving experience. Yeah. What is left, his song What is Left is, is a chart topper. I mean, I'm not exaggerating. I mean, yeah. it is a genuinely, phenomenally well-done song. And he'll play that that night. Well, you and I met, um, I don't know how long. It's been a couple years, right? Yeah, some time has gone by, yeah. yeah. Well, so I had started to do some work with um, Music Cambia, um, an organization that, that um, goes into prisons to work with incarcerated folks and bring teaching artists, musicians. Um, and you had been part of that program, correct? That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah, I was started with them. Uh, I had a three-year waiting list that I was on to get in, mm -hmm. and then I get in for four or five years, and then I've been out for five years. So I would say actively involved for about nine years, and they've been on my radar for about a dozen years. Yeah. Nice. So, and I had interviewed you to support, you know, a uh, benefit that they were doing, and, and you told me about the Jephtha Group, which is the work. That, that you do. Um, and, you know, when, I, when I'm talking to you, I'm always, you know, there's this question that comes up, right? Whether we call people, sort of the politically correct term these days is formerly incarcerated, right? Mm. But then you talk to people who say, oh, so he's an ex-con. And then that sounds kind of, it's like a pejorative term. It's a, it's a label that maybe puts you in a certain framework. But I wondered... You know, how does this conversation come up, and how is it that when you've you've served your time, right, at yeah. Sing Sing, and you're out um, in the world as a counselor, right? You're a yeah, yes, I am. Yeah, um, I'll get to the labeling in a minute. That yeah, I did. Um, I had a 15 year sentence with five years of parole. Uh huh. I did 12 and one third years. I got 15 percent off my sentence for meritorious conduct. And another six months off for getting my master's degree. Wow. And um, parole, I completed on June 6th of this year and had no violations of any sort, no curfew problems, no reporting problems, no positive urine screens, none for my entire time. But, um, yeah, I had a, a, a very good institutional record. Great. But I wanted to get to this labeling, which is interesting because I've heard kind of conventional people, regular people, talking to formerly incarcerated folk, and I've seen them go right by each other conversationally. One was using ex-con or former prisoner or prisoner or something like that, and the other one using words like people or human or person. <laughs> And you could just see them just going right by each other. Mm -hmm. they, they never, there was no connection. 
Now, first off, I'm glad there's some confusion because that means things are changing. Right. Right. There's things are changing with how you look at us. Yeah. And the old, you know, rock breaking, shackled convict with the striped outfit on and a shaved head and a tin cup. You know, those days, I would like to think, are long gone, except right. for maybe in Arizona or something. But, <laughs> um, hey, that's my but, home state. <laughs> well, I know, but they have some pretty... Mayacopa County, I've heard some nightmare stories. Oh, that's uh, yeah, terrible. I mean, I'm sorry they, to hear they, that. Yeah, there's a sheriff down there that runs a local jail, and he puts um, incarcerated women on a chain gang to dig graves with T-shirts on, they wear T-shirts that say, uh, I'm an ex-drug addict. And people driving by are encouraged by the horseback riding sheriffs to jeer at them. It's like, I've, I've but heard, it's, it's like them. Rome. It's like, um, you it's know, like, it's like the, the, the Rome, Col- right? Coliseum, right? Where we're like yeah, tearing people you know. limb from limb for their... Yeah, their... yeah. yeah. There's a famous doctor, Dr. Gabor Mate, and um, he says that if you were going to design a system to fail, that would be it. Yeah. You know, this whole idea of punishment and ridicule and ostracism. But now we're starting to look at formerly incarcerated person as language, you know, kind of, we're not criminals, we're not convicts, we're not prisoners. We might be inmates, or which has a kind of more has a better kind of sense of affinity or formerly incarcerated or, or I like criminal justice involved myself. But the bottom most line is that we're human. And that's why I appreciate this conversation so much is that we are human. Yeah. We are part of a human family. You're not a young Jewish girl from Park Slope. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely not young, family. Jason, but thank you. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. <laughs> you know, young at heart, I think. <laughs> we're we're all part of the human family, yeah. And we are human, and I think that gets lost, and our language betrays us. Yeah. Well, and I just think people get very fixated, right? So, since I've been doing this work, and I remember I had this party, which unfortunately, since you live up in Syracuse, you weren't here for it when I did a benefit at my house, and I met our good friend Dexter. And I remember him walking through the door, and he was the first one to arrive. And I, you know, That's I. Dexter. Yeah. The and, last one to leave. Right. That's Dexter. But it was like, you know, here he is walking into a stranger's house. He didn't know me from Adam. He saw the spread of food, and he got super excited. And I've literally never <laughs> had. I mean, I kind of make the joke, you know, he served a long time in prison, so my food, it's like. You know, his perspective is kind of, I I can't take it so much as a compliment. It's a lot better than prison food. We joke. But at the same time, he's such an enthusiastic guy, and we just immediately hit it off. And it's like, same with you and I when we had a conversation. It was, you know, we were looking back, right, at the notes from that conversation. And, you know, the way that you see the world, that what you learned through your master's degree, I'd like to talk a little bit about that, the the work that you did in prison and sort of what you've come to doing the work that you do about people, just about how to help yeah. human beings, right? Because yeah. you yeah. and I are both in that. And actually, we, yeah. So tell me a little bit about what you, the, yeah. your master's degree in prison. I want to hear more about that. Well, yeah, I had gotten a degree in finance from the University of Maryland. and I graduated, I walked the stage in 96, May of 96, I completed in uh, December of 95, and um, I had a career, 12, 13 years in finance. I got um, smashed thoroughly by the dot-com burst, bubble burst, bursting. Mm-hmm. I worked for two dot-coms, including NASDAQ. And went to prison after that. I never really recovered, to be honest. And I, my downfall began at that time. It just took two years to kind of hit bottom. But anyway, in preparation for my master's in pastoral care and counseling from the New York Theological Seminary, which is at Sing Sing Correctional Facility, they take in 10 people a year. 
The Theological the Seminary. Theological Seminary, yeah. It's on Riverside Drive right. in the city, mm -hmm. the main campus. Um, and they teach something called the Social Gospel, and I'll get into that. It's ecumenical and interfaith. Hmm. So we were with Islamicists, Protestants, Catholic, NOI guys, um, Jewish people, all colors and stripes, mm -hmm. everything. Buddhists, Zen, Taoists, all kinds. It's ecumenical and interfaith. So um, in preparation for that, I did, I started reading because I knew the reading workload. I was told it's going to be like 100 pages a day for a year. It's a two-year wow. program that's intense for a year. So they assign about 80 to 100 pages a day wow. for a year. Yeah, so to ramp up for that, I started studying philosophy, and I even joined the Hegel Society. And, hmm. But there's this thing, uh, you know, phenomenolo phenomenological studies, which okay. is our direct experience, and what we gain from direct experience in terms of knowing. And unless you've had a brother or a cousin or the janitor for your apartment building or some connection to the one of us, mm. your experience is going to be kind of limited. Right. Or at least secondhand, if not worse. And then that wall that they surround the prison with is very profound. Right? It keeps people in for sure, this but it also is being recorded. Oh sorry. It also keeps that's okay. It also keeps people out. Yeah. So until you have this kind of conversation where as as a lot of the famous ethicists would say, until you put a face to it, mm -hmm. it's not very real. Right. So I, I hope to be the face in this instant and that night on June twenty fifth at six thirty PM at El Barrio. We will have uh, probably a half a dozen or more um, criminal justice involved, including a performer um, that we can meet and talk to and interact with and, and break bread, mm -hmm. um, as my as my Italian uncle would say. Yeah. And, and that kind of sharing or fellowship or communion is what we learn at the New York Theological Seminary. And that is something called the social gospel in which we're all invited to a banquet you know, spiritually. And it's for us to eat. And the Greeks had a word agape, which is akin to kind of feeding one another. Hmm. I love that. Right? Yeah. It's a, you know, where you're, it's a sharing of nourishment, of love, of kindness and compassion. Um, and that's what I am uh, uh, called, if you will, to share. And that's what my work does. My work at a regional hospital at Deer Krause, uh Hospital Healthcare um, is part of the Northwell uh, healthcare system, which I think is on Long Island. I think it's based on Long Island. You guys mm -hmm. might have heard of it, Northwell. But anyway, we're their hospital up here, and you know, like 10,000 employees. And I'm part of their uh, substance abuse uh, division, and I'm a therapist. Mm -hmm. And I run an evening treatment program for substance yeah. abuse. Uh, um, patients who work um, and I do a continuing care group in the morning and a moral recognition group on Fridays but mm -hmm. my work is to invite people to this banquet and to help them overcome obstacles to eat mm -hmm. it's that simple it's crazy hard and it takes a whole it's a whole profession to get that to happen mm -hmm. but you have starving you have starving homeless um, opioid ridden or Xanax laden, you know, alcoholics that just can't kind of get to the table and feed themselves or feed others. And that's really what it's about, spiritual. Hmm. So, and the work that you're doing for Jephthah Group, so that's your, yes. that's your, that's your day job. But then for Jephthah yes. Group, um, I think you've worked with Music Cambia to offer workshops inside to, to people inside prisons right in, yeah and that's yeah, the I've partnered, I've partnered with music can be on that yeah and tell me a little bit about the population of people that your workshops deal with well actually if you get into the story the ancient story um of, of the banquet oh, yeah. of the of the banquet uh -huh. there's two stories here one and i'll tell two quick ones 
One story is of the banquet where there were a bunch of people closely related that were invited, but they were all too busy and basically too wealthy. One had cows to tend to, and one had land to look at, and you know, kind of busy with everyday things that consume uh, people that have you know been blessed. And they were told to go to the highways and the byways and the back alleys and invite. Hmm. And that those were the people that really needed the nourishment. Hmm. So the Jephtha group attempts to do that. We work with the mentally ill. They're actually called SMEVIs, serious acronym, S-M-I-V-I, seriously mentally ill and violent individuals. Mm -hmm. Right now that that's an institutional acronym. That's a subgroup of people who are incarcerated. It's a Mm -hmm. segregated population. There's about 80 of them out of the 1200 at Sing Sing, and they have their own floor, their own wing. They eat alone, they go to program alone, they kind of do everything alone because they're both preyed on by other prisoners and they don't know how to act in general population. So they are segregated fully. Mm -hmm. Um, And they have hygiene issues, very big hygiene and dental issues and behavioral issues and substance abuse issues. And music, music, and fellowship and kind of attending this banquet, if you will, is absolute water in the desert for them. Mm -hmm. It's an antidote. They start getting their hygiene together. They start brushing their teeth. They start complying with their medication regimen. They start interacting successfully with the Office of Mental Health staff. They start interacting with the corrections officers a little more effectively because of the camaraderie because of the rhythm what what do you attribute that to in terms of well again i i look at it spiritually there's something you know in recovery literature it's called the group conscience yeah like there's something that happens when a bunch of like-minded people get together and start vibing particularly rhythmically you know there's something (laughs) healing and redemptive that occurs. Oh yeah. I mean, you could you you could see that if you're a performer, you can actually see it in the crowd. But if you've been to a good concert, you can get carried away by it. I mean, literally, like hours later, you're still buzzing after the concert's over from the yeah. vibe. Well, it's so interesting, right? Because I started going to music. I mean, part of the reason I got involved with Music Cambia was because I knew Jesse Kilgus, who's now the director, right? I think she wasn't yeah, the great yeah. And so I met her and we had coffee and I just, you know, my own story is, you know, having hung out with a musician and then met, you know, started going out to music and it really, it saved me. I mean, I didn't have the same sort of, I didn't have the salvation requirements of some of the other people that you deal with, right? I wouldn't say being a Park Slope, poor poor me, a Park Slope housewife and, you know, mother, but that's fine. We we all do all soul. have our. We're all human. That's right. Yeah. We're all human, and so we all have our own um, issues, right? Loneliness, yes, depression, yes. things that occur. Yeah, even sure. though, even though you might have money and a, a nice roof or two over your head, um, there's still that part. We're, we still have a soul. We still have something to, yeah. that we need to let's, feed. Let's, we still need nourishment, right? Let me address that. Yeah. This, this, you know, the economics of this world is like talking Japanese and we're trying to talk Chinese, you know, the spiritual language. The fact of the matter is, in today's modern culture, 21st century world, with technology, we are more alone than ever. Oh, yeah. Our houses have gotten bigger. Our houses, our square footage has increased. Yeah. But the number of people you can call when you're sick has decreased. Yeah. Well, and the pandemic, the pandemic has certainly solidified that. And that made it perfectly clear. Yeah. That made it perfectly clear. Right. I mean, they they got to the point where they would go out on their balconies and sing just to hear somebody else's voice. (laughs) Right, right. Well, and that's what's interesting. So I was just going to go back to say that I, you know, music really became a salve for me in my life, which is why I think I got involved and could see very clearly how incredibly 
helpful and useful this is for human beings, yes. you know, and yes. especially people who are, you know, it came to me recently, this, this lotus, the idea of the lotus, right, which has been a long time symbol for Buddhism and this idea of rising up, you know, the lotus flower rises up out of the mud. And so oh, God, right. there's this idea, right, where like we need to rise up. Like those, you know, people who are downtrodden, people who are down in the mud, you know, they they need to be offered some something, some way of rising, right? It, being enlightened. Yes, it's even better. This case is even better than that. And hopefully the men you meet from the Carnegie Hall Music Advisory Committee on Friday, you know most of them, but the people listening will meet them. This is what takes that idea of rising up one step better. We are actually grabbing ourselves by the theoretical American bootstraps and engaging the world to help ourselves with your help. Yeah. I mean, this is really what we ought to be doing. Yeah. And I hate to use the word ought. That's probably the only time I've used it. In no, years. no, no, no. I, I think it's crucial because I think... We talk a lot, right? And the newspapers shout very loudly about everything that needs to happen. And people read those articles and they tisk tisk over, you know, dinner parties or whatever. It's my biggest problem as a longtime journalist. It's like I once stood up in a room full of journalists, like a big conference room and said, what are we doing? Do we have any effect or do people just listen to all the things, the terrible things that are going on and then tisk tisk and turn off NPR or to close the newspaper yeah. and don't do anything, right? But the reality yeah. is, is that we all, and I said this, I think, to one of the guys at a benefit my sister-in-law threw one night, you know, we're all complicit that people, he'd gone through foster care and, um, you know, I'm not, you know, I never ask what people do, why they ended up in prison, but we know something that put them there was was a mistake, right? It was a moment in their lives that they did something that, society could not tolerate and and shouldn't yeah. tolerate and yet I work with children who are live in communities where a lot of them end up in prison right and mm -hmm. and so to watch them and to see their communities and to, to see the lack of opportunity that they often have and just the the lack of trust in each other and the what could happen and you use the word ought to what ought to happen is that we get kids really early in this process so that we, because we are all complicit in this, living in this world with one another, right? If, if someone goes awry, I think that is, that is the fault of not just that person, but it's the fault of society to a certain degree. I think if we're all sort of living together, I think it's a very challenging thing to see how do we how do we share the burden? How do we bring opportunities to people who don't have them? Who who do yeah. go awry because they they do have, you know, darkness in their hearts for a moment because of the things that have happened to them, you know? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. And that that is a rubric that what you're kind of talking about in terms of the almost the generational piece to this or the societal thing on a child's development, it has to do from what I've witnessed having spent kind of 12 years or more in the belly of the beast is a sense of impoverishment. Mm -hmm. And often well, and, and probably people listening will automatically grab onto the economic kind of connotation of that and run with, well, they need resources, they need food pantries, they need medical care, and all that is very true. All that is very true. But what about of a different kind of connotation, one of just goodness? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? What about one of goodness? Like a neighbor... I mean, I remember growing up in, in my kind of bucolic existence where the woman outside our house used to, the grandmother who lived upstairs, I'd never met her, 
but she would throw out little bags of candy to us mm -hmm. as the kids ran down the alleyway. You know, and that gave me an early message that kind of other people aren't that bad. Right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. But in certain neighborhoods, they're throwing different things. But yeah. my point is that the experience, getting back to that phenomenological point of view, or even spiritual point of view, is that how many instances of goodness do those children encounter? Right. And it's as simple as a smile or a crayon box that's full of crayons. Right? You know, yeah, those think... kinds of things we take for granted, but make up one's experience with the world around them. Yeah. Well, and like to your point, the work the workshops that you've done, like you called that's them right. mad, right? Like so what yeah. is that? Music, art art and drama. drama. Yeah. That, that was the predecessor to Jeff the group. While I was in Sing Sing, I had gotten a job after I completed NYTS in two thousand nine, I had gotten a job. They placed me with the Office of Mental Health partnership with the alcohol and substance abuse treatment program to be a inmate program aid mm -hmm. for a dual diagnosis group, mm -hmm. right? So they had mental health and substance abuse. So I worked with them, I led the group and then ran the program for six years hmm. and got phenomenal training, phenomenal yeah. hands-on, two 37, 30 year plus veterans of the doc system, you know, uh, professional staff, licensed clinical social worker and a master's degree substance abuse counselor. You know, got top of the line training and I camp in my cell. That's how I looked at it. I think I told you, right? Yeah. I used to camp in my cell on my bunk and then go to work. But they, uh, they kind of led that kind of good experience for me. Yeah. And, and I shared it with others. And one of the things we developed was it started off as creative energy on Friday. Hmm. You know, all week we were hammering at anger issues, and child abuse, and all these hard-hitting, disturbing topics all week, twice a, twice a day. So we said, listen, on Fridays, let's have creative energy where we can blow off some steam and have some fun. And that's how it started. And then we developed it into a music, one Friday of music, the next Friday was art, the next Friday was drama. And then we'd go back to music, art, and drama. Music, art, and drama. We ended up developing that over the years into two, a summer production and a, and a winter production at the Christmas show, mm. at the Christmas party, um, organic theater, where the guys would write the music, the, the participants would write the music and the play itself. Awesome. And the first year we had the whole gallery, other, you know, 80 other inmate patients attend and maybe 10 to staff. By the time we were done, we had about 50 professionals from all over the facility, and I think some even from Albany, to come and watch this kind of spectacle. That's awesome. And they did like the 12 days of Christmas, mm. but they used prison things. Nice. I, I don't want to share them with you, but you know, it was, it was, it was pr prisonified, you know, <laughs> right. institutionalized. And it was hilarious, and it was uplifting and positive, and, we had one report, I'm thinking of one guy now, and he had long, long hair. Uh, I think he was Samoan, and he didn't talk with anybody. And when he drew, he drew concentric circle, very tight ones, that's all he drew. Mm -hmm. Every art class, that's all he drew was concentric circles, totally in his own inner world. By the end of this three-year experience, he lasted, he was one of the longer patient inmates, he lasted a little longer and he actually had come out of himself hmm. and was approaching what people would call conventional or normal by the time I left. Nice. And it got, you know, we, we his peers would positive peer pressure would kind of push him to step out and try to act or try to sing a little bit. We featured him a couple of times and he eventually kind of came out of his shell right in front of our eyes it was amazing and he was not the only story like that i think fellowship and and being around and the experience with goodness good things and having that opportunity in music in particular yeah do that work well, and they reached a profound 
uh, they reach the ones that are a little more disturbed, I think a little more intensely. Yeah. Well, creative expression like is something... Like we take it for granted where they, they, they hear it. Yeah. Well, I've been doing, you know, this drum workshops that were sort of putting a little bit into the Jep- under the Jephtha group, it potentially working with yeah. some some of the yeah. homeless people Love that you. I've been working with because it's really the same, right? It's a lot of the same population. I think a yeah. lot of these people are in and out of jail. They Absolutely. Definitely serve time. So, but it's really fascinating, you know, as you know, doing the work. It's really fascinating to work with people because they they have the language for it without you even having to say you know, I mean, someone yesterday, I often say that the reason that I know that everybody has rhythm, because very often people will come, I'll set up all my instruments and they won't, oh, I don't have rhythm, they'll say, or something along those lines. They'll say, no, they're not, they're not ready. They're just going to watch. And I always try to put something in their hands because lo and behold, they, they need the rhythm. They need the movement. They need the yeah. getting it out. They need to be part of it, but they're afraid, right? And they don't want to. So but it's interesting because I always say, um, I know that we all have rhythm because we had rhythm in the womb. Yeah, right? sure. And our heart. Our, our heart, heart is, a, is a bass drum. Exactly. And so there are these, these rhythms that we feel from a very, I mean, from the inception, right? And, yeah. and then through yeah. our lives, yeah. through our heartbeat and through our breath. Right. And we we are about rhythm. But but last week, you know, there was a woman and she said the womb thing before I did. You know, I didn't I don't you don't have to explain it to people who need it. What it is, because the minute they pick up the instrument, they know what you're trying to do. And yeah, yeah. And then they when they experience it, when they kind of start trying to work together to create a rhythm they feel it so quickly that fellowship you talk about yeah that yeah. that sharing that i'm trying yeah. to get at i call it getting in tune yeah but it's amazing and the language cuz sometimes you know they were trying these two women last week well three but really the two were really working on how to communicate to to make it sound good and to get the the best out of themselves. And they were kind of, it it got a little tense because they were coming at it from different places and being a little critical, but I kind of stood back. And then when the music kind of started and and the one got up to dance and you thought, and there was such joy. There was joy. Yeah, yeah. And they were laughing and they were joyful and they were so grateful. That just yeah, for the yeah. instruments, it wasn't even, they'd come up with it themselves. It wasn't even. It's, it's, it's a real honor. Yeah. It's a real honor to witness that. I, I've seen it hundreds of times when people who haven't connected or haven't talked or haven't participated in much in decades or years anyway, mm-hmm. or sometimes months, make those initial kind of connections where I am heard and I'm hearing someone else. Yeah. And Johan, Johan Harry had a, has a Ted talk about, and I, I suggest people look this up called everything you thought knew about addiction was wrong. Hmm. Johan Harry, J O H A N H A R I. Mm -hmm. And he says in short, you have to see the 12 minute Ted talk, but he says in short, that everything you know about addiction is wrong because we've approached it from a punitive standpoint, you know, the whole war on drugs kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then we look at it as abstinence is the answer. And he mm-hmm. says no. From his research that took him around the world, he said connection. <laughs> he puts it on connection is the antidote. Oh, yeah. If you're suffering and I come to you in love, and we have a heart to heart. It will change your world. It does. Right? Mm-hmm. And everybody everybody listening to me can think about a time when they were down and out or suffering or maybe in college and didn't have rent or were failing the tours or something was going awry, maybe mm-hmm. the marriage, 
I don't know, maybe they spent too much money, their credit card bills were becoming over, you know, something was going wrong. Yeah. And somebody, a husband, a brother, a father, came to them in love and maybe talked them through it or just held them or let them cry, right? And that mm-hmm. sense of connection was the balm, was, was, was the curative motion that set things in motion. Yeah. Yeah, and it's the same. It's the same for people who are forsaken or downtrodden or in prison or quote unquote sneezes. They're they're just as human, and they need that. They need that connection. Maybe even more. I would argue. Well, yeah, for sure. But but in a way, they're they've isolated themselves out of yes. like sheer disappointment. That's all I. That's yeah. all I read. Shame and guilt. Yeah. Shame and guilt yeah. Is like is like they're and and you have people on the street working that. Walking, walking in the shame and guilt. Oh my God! Somebody's and it's done. so amazing yeah. because if you can look them in the eye and introduce yes. yourself and That's offer right. them some moment of, That's right. you know, release. You know, once right. I had a guy who sat down with me and he drummed for about, I mean, what is one of our drumming little things? Probably four minutes, right? So we did a whole, you know, little diet, try little jam. And at the end of it, he just looked like completely freaked out. And he said, shit. And I said, what? He goes, I haven't not thought about my shit for that long. Maybe ever. So for four minutes, he had a clear mind and a clear heart. And it, it, he performed with me. It was before the pandemic. And he actually came up in front of other people and was willing to drum with me and to do that because in that four minutes he saw a glimmer of hope that something that music the focus on it could push away all the crap that he's constantly shamed by guilted by worried about whatever obsessed with that's right that's right that's right and and the sense of a banquet, just for definition, is kind of music and food and conversation and connection. I mean, yeah. I think that's a perfect metaphor, illustration for what we're trying to achieve here. Yeah. And going to create on the twenty fifth at six thirty. I, I love that, and it's exactly perfect. And it so is perfect. I think that's exactly why we're having this event, and everybody, you know, actually around this time. We've all been sort of cloistered, so yeah, there was a, a mo- there was a moment early on in the pandemic. I think we were talking, and it was sort of interesting, right? Because we sort of felt like you know it gave people who've never been incarcerated a little yeah. bit of a feeling, right? A little bit yeah, of a we window. Got, we, got, we got a lot of interest. Us formerly incarcerated folk got a lot of interest from a lot of different kinds of people. Yeah. Either just random questions or organizations coming to us. How do we handle this? Yeah. How do we handle like, isolation? Isolation. How do we handle solitude? All of a sudden we became subject matter experts. It well, was, it was really be- interesting. Because you know what? Until more recently, most of us, knock on wood, have yeah. not had our freedoms taken away. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so in well, this country well, in particular, we don't really know what uh, that is a lot yeah, of us there's no power outages there's right tv is incessant we right? get to do whatever we want whenever we want it and all of a sudden the last year has given us a little window so maybe we can be more empathetic to those people yeah. who have literally had their freedoms taken away and and a little bit of compassion right it's a word that that i think we've used before it's compassion empathy and i just want to say that the solitude or the isolation that I've experienced and others like me have experienced has given us opportunity. Yeah. It's not just that, because if that was the case, then everybody that has gone to institutions would be kind of healed. But a lot of us, I'm going to say 40% or more, have spent our isolated time or solitude examining ourselves, our lives, our family, our society. Mm-hmm. And have now reintegrated in a much more meaningful, beneficial way, if you want to look at it economically, or spiritually whole me- way. Mm-hmm. And that night, 
on the 25th, you'll be able to meet at least a half dozen of us who have done that. Right. No, I and, think and it's important. And are bigger and better people for that. I mean, often, if you, if uh, another story I want to throw in, and I want to get to the Jeff story too before we close, the is that sometimes our scars become our signs of like redemption and victory. Yeah. Right. You know, if um, sometimes the worst things that happen to us can be, there's a Greek word called metanoia, which is a 180 degree turn, right. where what was meant to hurt us helps us. Yeah. yeah. So, for example, in my case, I was a taker before being in prison. I was in take. I was a taker. Um, you know, I was money hungry. I was, you know, middle level, middle level mid-level finance guy and all about that world, scars and martinis and just that kind of debauchery. And now I live a relatively clean life, kind of on the boring side, but relatively mm-hmm. clean. I enhance the communities I'm a part of. I, I work diligently to do that. Uh, I consider myself a giver. You um, took me fishing, so you're very I generous. Took you fishing, yeah, and your husband. And you <laughs> brought the biggest fish. Look at that. <laughs> My bass. I that think it's still in the freezer. I couldn't bear to <laughs> eat it. I don't know why. <laughs> that is a monster. You, you caught a big bass, 14, 16 inch bass. That was that was funny. You were like, "My indicators under my bobbers underwater. What does that mean?" <laughs> it's like you got a fish. What do you think it means? Yeah, that was great. That was great. And um, yeah, that was a good time. So. Yeah. Um, yeah, that, that, you know. No, I think it's, a, I think the transformation is crucial. And just real quick about Jephthah Group. That's the word these days. That is not rehabilitation. Yeah. It's transformation. It's metanoia. It's going from one direction to going the exact opposite. Yeah. And that happens to all kinds of people. I mean, midlife crisis is, is usually Hi. a big sign of yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, I right? went through a big transformation and music was really the catalyst. And so yeah. that, I think that's why it's so important for me. And it's why I totally understand, I mean, not totally, obviously, as many conversations yeah. as I have with people who've been inside prison, I know I'll never, well, I guess I don't know I'll never understand it. But at this point, it's not something I know viscerally, and I don't pretend to totally understand. But I do think that that sense of the ability to allow music to transform from what is, a very sort of hard, uh, lonely, lonely, place. metallic, yeah, gray world. Yeah, it, it brings it to life. It's yeah, like and I think there are so many, point. so many art forms, like you talked about, music, art, drama, so many different yeah. art forms that I think are really transformative. That they have the power to transform and and to yeah. offer those to people. Is, is really is really a huge gift. And that's why yeah. everybody should show up on the 25th. You can talk to yeah. Jason Moore there. Introduce yourself. Look for him. And he'll be speaking. Um, and, you know, ideally we can all, like you said, break bread together. There'll be good food, yes. good music. And good music. Um, I would like to tell the story of the, the name. Okay. If I can, in brief. It, it comes from the Christian Bible, Judges chapter 11. Mm -hmm. But it's about a man named Jephthah who was an Israelite and is listed as one of the great men of faith, Jephthah, J-E-P-T-H-A. And he was an outcast in his village. His mother was a harlot or a prostitute, however you want to read that, in, in Hebrew society that made you, you know, quote unquote, a bastard. You were, you were, ostracized and they kicked him out to the perimeter of the town and out there he ran around with a bunch of scoundrels I forgot what the kind of King James word was but mm. were, I can imagine like a motorcycle gang on the edge of town right right you know they were they were scoundrels that lived apart from the main community um, they certainly weren't part of the temple society um, now they went to war The Israelites went to war and they needed a a general and they called on Jephthah and he negotiated very craft in a very crafty manner 
his way to the battleground and won. And it was one of the greatest battles for the Israelites hmm. that Jephthah won for them in terms of taking over the promised land. And um, Jephthah went down in history as a great judge and a great general and a great man of faith for having done that. So that's where, you know, sometimes I was told in seminary that often the people with the answer are the ones that have been in the problem. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I leave that with you to kind of think about and we'll pick yeah. it up in person. In yeah, I absolutely think, you know, that, you know, and I, I was I, in my work, in the school that I was doing work with in the projects, you know, the reality is that you do have to leave it. You do at some point have to involve the people who are most affected to know how to solve it. You can't yeah. sit in some office somewhere no. deciding for other people that you don't really know what their experience has been. That I see as a... probably do more harm than good. Well, it's it's hard because intentions are clearly good, but sure. but I'm I'm really that's why I, I love your organization and what you do because you, you know full well what these guys yeah. need and you're helping them also, you know, this retreat, the money is from the twenty fifth will also go toward a retreat that we've been talking right. about, right? Yes. We're gonna build it, we're gonna have a four day retreat for a half a dozen or a dozen ex offenders mm -hmm. in the cat skills about resilience. Yeah. But he's rebounding, you know, people that have been you know, post incarceration, resiliency rebounding. And we hope to produce some really good music. And Carnegie Hall is very interested yeah. in our music and what will come from that. Right, and because they have a co sponsor. They also have a program, right? In yes. in Yeah, Simpson. they do they do the performances. It's an interesting relationship. Mm -hmm. They they put on they stage like four official concerts in the in the um theater at sing 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 has a 150 person theater like movie theater just like get them on the street mm -hmm. stage and all that with a curtain and all that mm -hmm. and they put on four performances a year they bring in all the lighting and instrumentation mm -hmm. and microphones but they bring in about a half a dozen tractor trailers of equipment and set up the four concerts a year and music cambia would teach us what we need to know to actually perform. Cool. And we that's called Musical it. Connections, right? Musical, musical Connections at the Wheel Institute. Mm -hmm. That's right. Of Carnegie Hall. That's, right. their, that's their program. Their so that's the beauty program. is that there are some really wonderful programs yes, out there, there including yes, yours, there that bring people, you know, some of these um, tools of, of uh, salvation, let's say. Yeah, yeah. It's salvic. And, and I just want to emphasize that it's two parties, cooperative, it's collaborative. Right. Yeah. There's a reaching out from the mainstream, and there's a reaching up from those who are, you know, have lived experience. Yeah. And well, that's what we need more of. The reaching out is there, and they certainly could use more, but we also need the reaching up and out from those with lived experience. Yeah. They need to organize and step up and be heard and be counted yeah. and... And that's that's a lot of the work, right? It's like yeah, I, I show up, I show up with my drums at the homeless shelters, and sometimes nobody joins me. I mean, that's the impoverishment we just spoke about. Right? Yeah, it's a, it's a spiritual condition. Right? Yeah, there's just not enough good going on, and most of them are probably sitting in the background or in the distance watching you. Yeah, and would love more than anything else to join. I know. But well, that's that's the work, trauma, right? Yeah, and trust issues, all kinds of obstacles. Right? I know. I know. It's, it's absolutely overwhelming. Right. Well, we're trying, right? We're trying to do yeah. the work. and We're trying. We're, trying. <laughs> we're, we're blazing a trail. We really are. I mean, this is something that will be looked back in 20 years and commented on, but we are blazing a trail. Yeah. Together. Well, and happy to, happy to blaze the trail. Happy yeah. to blaze the trail with you and to invite everyone listening to come join us on this path on the 25th. Um, on uh, it's up in Harlem and 99th Street, and it's a great um, venue that we're co-sponsoring with the Jazz Habitat, um, and it's going to be a great night. And uh, we invite you all to come. 
Open your hearts, open your wallets, and help us do this work. Thank you, Jason, so much. As You're very usual, welcome. nice to chat. Very well. Much appreciated. Thank you. And remember, everybody, talk to strangers. And <laughs> if they're uh, if they should have been formerly incarcerated, don't let that stop you. They're amazing people. Thank you. Humans, amazing humans. Humans. That's right. <laughs>